Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with John Kay. John is an economist, um, but with a vast experience in, in the world of business and finance. Um, he's the author of, my count from Wikipedia was 12 books. There, there may be some missing there. Um, so, uh, and uh, in particular, the book that I've read is this one, uh, Radical Uncertainty. Uh, well, that's not showing very well on the camera. I'll get it up in the edit. Uh, decision making for an unknowable future, and this this idea of of, co- of a complex world or an uncertain world has been a, a theme on this podcast. So I really wanted to dive in, uh, John, to your work in this book. So welcome. Well, good to be with you, Richard. So what uh, what was it that drew you to writing about uncertainty? What, what was the genesis for this for this book? Oh, I suppose it's been an issue for a long time. But, of course, my co-author on this book, book was Mervyn King, uh, former governor of the Bank of England. And he and I actually wrote a book together, it seems unbelievable, 40 years ago, as young dons on the British tax system. But actually, the genesis of this book was a, a seminar that there was at the Bank of England when Mervyn retired. And when we talked about that, I talked a bit about uncertainty, and we realized that we'd been, um, we'd been thinking very similar things and had, in a way, similar takes on the financial crisis of 2008 and its causes. And that was both a failure to understand uncertainty and a belief on the part of many people in the financial sector that the kind of risk models they were constructing enabled them to control uncertainty and manage risk in ways that were shown in 2008 to be quite false. Right. Um, so what is it do you, do you think that we, we, un, we misunderstand about uncertainty and, and what is it that we should be taking on in terms of appreciating uncertainty? Um, it's interesting to go back 100 years ago because of two books published in 1921 one of them by an American economist called Frank Knight, and the other by the most famous British economist of the century, uh, Maynard Keynes. Keynes's book was actually called um, A Treatise on Probability. And what Keynes was doing in that was to cast doubt on the ways in which the probability theory, the statistical theory that had been developed in the previous in the 50 years before 1921, were being applied more and more widely. And he was skeptical about that. And Risk uh, Knight made from an essentially very different perspective. He was an American farm boy, not a member of the uh, Bloomsbury set. (laughs) From a very different perspective, made a distinction between risk, which was something that could be described probabilistically, and something that could not. And they set out their stall in 1921. And in the couple of decades that followed, there was a fair degree of debate about that analysis, that these distinctions. But actually, it was a it was a debate which they lost. And they lost really as a result of the work that was done by American economists and uh, uh, management scientists during the Second World War who were developing mathematical models and axiomatic descriptions of how people manage risk and uncertainty. And they elided that distinction between risk and uncertainty, risk which you could describe probabilistically, and uncertainty which you could not. And indeed, by 1960, Milton Friedman, a famous American economist at the time, would write Frank Knight, who had actually been his predecessor at the University of Chicago, made this distinction between risk and uncertainty, risk that you could describe probabilistically, uncertainty which you could not. And Friedman wrote, I shall not refer again to this distinction because I do not believe it is valid. We may treat people as if they applied probabilities to every possible event, and therefore there's no distinction between risk and uncertainty. And that was a mistake. And in a sense, the epitome of the revelation of that mistake came in 2007 as the financial crisis was breaking, when David Vineyard, who was then the Goldman Sachs CFO, 
said, we've been experiencing 25 standard deviation events several days in a row. Now, if you know anything about statistics at all, you know that you can't experience 25 standard deviation events even once, far less several days in a row. What he meant was that we we experienced events that were simply impossible in terms of the Goldman Sachs models. And that was the demonstration of the limits of this kind of probabilistic reasoning. Right. But but why was there such resistance to this idea that some things couldn't be modelled in probabilities or understood in terms of probability? Because people want to believe they have tools for managing and understanding risk. And that was very evident in the years up to 2008. If you talk to people in banks, they said, but we have these very sophisticated, highly complex mathematical models, which enable us to control risk. If you talk to very senior people in banks, they mostly knew there the were such models. They had no idea of what the content of the models actually are. And I remember an occasion when I gave a talk to a group of, um, it was actually the general counsel for a group of banks in London. And before, before it, we talked about the topic, and I offered the idea that I'll talk about what value at risk models actually are. And what was really interesting was the reaction of the people at that event, to my talk, which was firstly to say, uh, it's funny, no one has ever given us a talk like this before. And secondly, you mean there is no more to this mathematical sophistication? than what you are describing? And the answer was no, there there really wasn't. Uh, There was elaboration of the model, but the basic structure of the model was what what I was setting forth. And of course, you couldn't control risk in that kind of way. And that was shown, which doesn't stop people going on using essentially analogous models to manage in inverted commas. I don't know how you do inverted commas. (laughs) on <laughs> Zoom to manage and divert almost <laughs> risk uh, to this day. Right. Yes. And um, I, I mean, I just relate to this in terms of my early days as a consultant. I tend to work much more on the sort of human factors now and leadership factors, but I can remember pulling business models together and just reflecting on the absurdity of these chain of assumptions that you'd have to put into the model in order to come <laughs> out with your your projections um, you know, down 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 the line. Uh, and you, you have this wonderful image in the book of towards the end of the book, when you talk about modeling and the, um, the problems with modeling, um, you know, I think this is a discre- I think you're referring to the HS2 modeling and that it is like balsa wood in a wind tunnel. <laughs> that struck a chord. And I thought that's exactly what we were doing. Yeah. And probably that was, we were referring to web tag, which is a model you um, used by the department for transport appraising all transport projects in the in the UK, all transport projects from HS2 to signing out of Benton Road. And the, there's a, a template on that of, for that, which you feed your numbers into. But it tells you most of the numbers you might need. So if you want to know how many passengers there will be in a car on Friday afternoons in 2036, there's a number in WebTag for that. If you want to know what the British growth rate will be in 2081, there's a number in web tag from from that and so on. And you see this still across a whole variety of spheres. Uh, People creating these uh, huge spreadsheets in which you ask yourself, suppose I knew everything I could conceivably know about the world. How would I make the calculation on this decision? And then you constructed your spreadsheet you don't know what any of these numbers are, so you make them all up. And uh, there's an even worse version of that, where um, conceding that you don't know what many of these numbers are, you engage in a Monte Carlo simulation, so-called, where you make these numbers up over and over again, and then believe that what comes out of the computer is a probability distribution of... uh, 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 of what the outcome will be. The only interesting thing about that is to ask why anyone could believe that that was an interesting or insightful way to do the analysis. Yeah. 
Yeah, and the other thing you introduced me into in the book, which I which I like, was this idea that you've got um, you've got whatever the probabilities that that a model might spit out. But what, of course, what we forget is to 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 multiply that by the or to factor in to what extent that model is an accurate representation of reality, right? Which we, which we don't do. Yeah. So to make the kind of statement Vinayar made about the probability of a particular outcome in the real world. You have to multiply the probability that you get from the model by the probability that the model is true. Well, you don't know what the probability <laughs> that it's true is, except that it's almost certainly very low. Right. But it, but it's interesting to me that we don't ever even ask ourselves that question. Yeah. Do we? Oh, certainly in my experience, you know, we, we're not asking ourselves what... And people build models and they really do want to believe that these models are a true statement of the world. And yeah. we're in danger here of going too far in knocking models. And I, I believe in models. I've spent a lot of my life building models. Models are really useful. But models are models in economics and business are essential. I think they're best talk to, thought about as parables. What you're doing is you're finding uh, you have a very large problem which you can't analyze completely. You find a smaller problem, which is a bit like your real problem, which you can analyze. And if you do that thoughtfully, you may be able to get insights into the real mo- the real problem, or um, you may be able to identify the parameters that matter for the real problem. So it, you mentioned HS2 earlier. Um, the model that is developed for appraising HS2 is just ridiculous in terms of the, the detail, the specification of things you don't know, uh, and that you can't know. But if you think about a simple model structure of a model for it, you realize quickly that there are two things that really matter. One is how much more valuable is it to people to get to Birmingham half, half an hour quicker in an hour rather than an hour and a half. And actually, you can get evidence of that at the moment, because as a matter of fact, if you want to go from London to Birmingham, you can go relatively quickly from Euston to Birmingham New Street, or somewhat more slowly from Marylebone to uh, to Birmingham Moor Street. So if anyone actually had asked that question, you can get quite a lot of evidence on it straight away. As far as I know, they haven't. And the second thing, the, the other big thing which you want to know, and there's evidence from other countries on this, is if you speed up linkages between uh, the capital city and a provincial city, is that, does that do more for economic development in the capital or the provincial city? And I think the evidence we have from places like France and Japan is that there's rather more benefit to the capital city than there is to the provincial city. But that's something you would want to do serious work on. But that's what I mean by saying we're trying to identify the factors that matter, and then we can go away and do research on these particular subjects rather than just making up endless strings of numbers. Yeah. And, and there's a passage in the book that I like where you contrast uh, the approach of, an, of a NASA engineer to that of a, an economist, and, and, you, and, and you look at the sort of the practical ways in which a NASA engineer might break down the problems versus vis-a-vis, a, a, you know, an economist might do it. Um, and I really like that. And the two versions of that in the book, actually, one is we ask at quite an early stage, uh, we describe how NASA launched a, a, a probe to investigate Mercury. And it actually took seven years from uh, NASA launching the probe to it reaching Mercury with a very complicated computed trajectory. And after seven years, uh, the probe went into orbit around Mercury in more or less exactly the way NASA estimated seven years earlier. So we ask the question, uh, if NASA can do this, why can't economists do it? Why can't the Fed Reserve do it? And the answers to that are, uh, are three, really. One is that we know what the equations of planetary motion are. We've understood uh, the solar system for several hundred years. So we know, that we know the structure of the system quite well. Second, it's stationary in the sense that these equations remain unchanged. They're the same today as they were 500 years ago. 
And the third thing is that they're not affected by our beliefs about them. Venus does not care what we think about the trajectory of, of Venus. It carries on regard. But none of these things are true in business and finance. We don't have the degree of understanding of the system, uh, and we can't hope to have it, that people can get of the equations of planetary motion and of rocket trajectories. Um, they don't remain unchanged, even if we do understand them, and they're very much affected by our beliefs about them. So these are reasons why economics and finance are just fundamentally different from these kind of physical sciences and are going to remain so. Yeah. Another example I took, which was, I thought was quite amusing, was we came across a passage uh, from Edward Prescott, who's actually a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And he was taking what um, a rocket engineer, how he described what he was doing, uh, with what he, Prescott, as an economist was doing. And Prescott said, this shows that we're actually doing the same thing. If you put the two paragraphs side That's by right. side, you see that they're not at all doing the same thing for the reasons I described. Yeah. Uh, but it's, an interesting, it's interesting to see him make that kind of error. Because some yeah. people said that economists have physics envy, that they want to believe they can have the kind of certainties uh, which physics, in certainly some areas, enables physicists. Yeah, and I, I would say it's not just economists. I think I think you, you look at the if you like the management class, and my experience of you sort of in management, we create similarly elaborate models uh, around projections for projects, for example, you know, major projects, and we treat those in a bit in some similar ways that economists might treat an economy is is to boil it all down into a set of an assumptions and model it out and project timelines and and and, and think in probabilistic terms for, in terms of outcomes and it, it seems the same folly to me um yeah. just on a smaller scale and um yeah and cons- you're right consultants are in many ways even worse than yeah. this than economists are <laughs> right. and indeed for a time in my life I ran a business which was selling economic consultancy, and we we developed models of these kinds for our clients because that was what they wanted. Uh, But I sat down one day and asked myself, if these models were useful, why don't we develop any of them for our own business? Right. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Yeah, and how many consulting firms, if you go into them, have, you know, elaborate five-year plans, you know, not many. Uh, yeah. the same. Uh, and another issue which I remember thinking about there was people would ring you up and say, you know, what will the dollar sterling exchange rate be in 2030 or something like that? And the answer which I thought was the right answer to give to that question is, I don't know and nor no, no does anyone else. Tell me why you want to, the answer to that question and we'll try and find a sensible question to which it's possible to give an answer. But that answer never went down well. And I came to think there are two reasons why it doesn't go down well. One is the very simple one, that the person who's ringing you up has been asked that question by his boss and uh, needs to come up with a number. And the second problem is that whatever I might say about this, there is someone in an investment bank who will say, well, I think it will be between 115 and 120 or something like that. And uh, yeah. th- there are a group of people like that who will give you the ans- an answer to any question you, you want. No one will take the answer very seriously, in fact, but it fills in the box on the spreadsheet. Right. Yeah, and the other thing I liked about that latter passage where you had the, the, two, the two passages together with the, with the engineer was that in spite of the fact that the NASA engineer is working with more with a, to a greater degree with stationary processes or the, and and ha, in some senses has more certainty he's still accepting this level of uncertainty and he's zeroing in on what are the parameters that make the biggest difference and doing research around those and i i, I like like the way that that he was framing the problem yeah that's right and that is back to as, as I said, there are two main types of use of models. One is to identify the parameters that matter and then to provoke research on doing that. The other is, as I described, a, a sort of parable. Um, 
I'll give you an example, which I always like, of the, of the parable story. There's a rather famous model by developed by an economist called George Akerlof, uh, which is the lemons model. And the proposition with which he started was uh, General Motors cars, some of them were called lemons. They were supposedly cars that were made on Friday afternoon when people had been out <laughs> had a beer or two and weren't focusing on the, the job with quite the precision uh, that they might have during the rest of the week. And after you've bought a car and you used it for a year or two, you know whether it's a lemon or not. But if you want to sell it, the buyer does not know what, uh, whether it's a lemon. And um, uh, how, what happens to the market? when you have that kind of asymmetry of information between buyer and seller. Now, Akerlof described the kind of dynamics of that kind of model and explained why these sort of markets don't work terribly well. And people have talked about lemons now for 40 years as an illustration of how uh, markets may not work very well when the buyer knows more than the seller knows. So that IPOs, for example, may have a similar structure. Uh, that the buyer, uh, the seller obviously knows no more than the buyer is. So there's the lemons problem. But I remember talking about that at a conference, and someone got up after I'd finished and said he was the general secretary of the Retail Motor Federation. And this story was a, a monstrous libel on his honest, hardworking member. And uh, I thought there were two things wrong with that. One was, uh, that's not most people's experience of used car dealers. But the other really was that this isn't a story about used cars. It's a way of thinking about a, a generic problem in economics, which is that information is unequally distributed. And we need to find institutions. And it's interesting to think about how that happens in the used car market and elsewhere how you find institutions that deal with, tackle that problem, the asymmetry of information. Once again, it's the model as parable, is the model as means of flagging for you what you need to be thinking about, what you need to do research on, rather than the model, as it were, giving you a, an accurate statement of what's going to happen in the way NASA's model could. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, and that's and there's 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 this idea. I think. Well, I love the I love the quote that you include from Keynes about how um, we should think of economists to be more like dentists, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and my partner's a dentist, so there's perhaps another reason it's salient. But um, yeah, and let's just focus on the few, the few factors that that matter, right? And and dentists, I suppose, have models, right, of teeth and so on, and they that you know that that they can use to train and. And develop on, but they, um, you know, they develop like a set of heuristics almost, right? Like the, 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 some, some rules of thumb, some things to focus on in particular scenarios. Um, they don't try to model the entire mouth and every possible uh, it, outcome of any one intervention on, on the entire mouth, right? Yeah, um, it's, it's a good analogy. And if you, I mean, economists have taken the view of the last 40 years that the ideal is to build up a, mo a macroeconomic model of the economy as a whole uh, from the behavior of individuals. And that yeah. looks rather, sounds rather plausible. And it's something I was ready to believe for probably the first half of my career. Uh, but um, it's too difficult. You have to make too many simplifying assumptions in order to make any progress building up to the, to, to the aggregate from the individual. So it's like saying um, uh, you, you, you go to a doctor, your doctor with a headache, and he says, well, I need to have a model of your whole body and whole life experience and health system in order to, uh, in order to advise you. And the better answer is to the pragmatic heuristic you describe, which is, a lot of my patients find if they take an aspirin, it helps. <laughs> right. Right. And then this, this, this question that seems, you know, the, the recurs throughout the book um, is, 
is what is going on here? So talk to us a bit about like the importance of that question and why you stress it to the degree, degree you do. Yeah. I mean, it sounds incredibly banal, but that phrase comes from uh, one of the, one of the few business strategy gurus, which I think is worth, worth listening to. Um, that's Dick Rumelt, who's at um, UCLA and uh, has written what I think is, let me recommend it to your listeners, good, good strategy, bad strategy, which I think is the best strategy book of the past decade. Uh, but he, he described a, an occasion when a, a business friend of his asked if he could sit on, in on a few MBA classes. And at the end of several of them, the, the businessman said to Rumelt, look, there's not really only ever one question in all of this, which is what is going on here? And that's really insightful in the sense that it's saying, can we find some kind of narrative description that links together the information we have and makes sense of it? And that's actually the way humans manage a complex problem. It's by narrative mechanisms in the first instance, not, uh, uh, not the kind of models we've been talking about. And we are, as humans, natural storytellers in the way that we're not natural computer modelers. <laughs> and that's not an accident, actually. If it was um, really useful to be like a computer, evolution would have made us a lot more like computers than we actually are. But this um, what is going on here story resonated particularly, I think, with Mervyn and others when we started talking about the financial crisis in 2008. Because what, what was happening was people were engaging in loads of trades and transactions in these rather complex securitized products and derivatives based on them. And there are two broad counts you could give as to what was going on here. One was that people were uh, managing a portfolio of risk much more effectively by transferring risks to people who could bear these risks more, more cheaply. The kind of insurance model of risk transfer in which the insurer can take this risk, which would be too large uh, for you actually to bear yourself. Or it could be the betting shop model of risk, in which people who know a bit about what they're doing dump risks on people who know less about what they're doing. And in the end, what was revealed was it had been the betting shop model rather than the insurance model. But that's asking, you know, what is going on here? How do I find a narrative explanation in the same way as we were doing with Akolov's parable about the lemons, uh, a narrative account of what's happening? And we came to see that this is the, the kind of method that lawyers or historians use. What the court or the good barrister does, for example, is he's, you're given a mass of documents, a whole range of claims and counterclaims about an event. And you try to sort them through in order to find some coherent account of what it was was happening. And that, of course, is what historians do as well. It goes back to a remark you made earlier about Keynes and what economists should be doing. And it was really the point he was making was that economics done properly was a subject that should draw on a whole variety of disciplines and methods that part of it is a quantitative subject, but part of it is a narrative subject in the way we're describing. And if you have to succeed as an economist, you have to be able to, as it were, blend all these things together. Right. Which and that's, he was remarkably able to do. Yes, but that's not, I mean, if you think about the training of economists or really any, you know, or, or many of us in professions, it's, it's we, we're not set up to learn in that way, are we? we no, that's right. I think. Um, and uh, it goes back to the point I made earlier about physics envy on the, on the part of economists. That, for understandable reasons, economists really would like it to be a subject like that. So you could put your probe around Mercury exactly where he wanted it to be. And a lot of business people, of course, want it to be like that as well. 
And you yes. encounter quite a lot of them who believe that by virtue of their superior wisdom and knowledge, uh, it is like that. That if only all these pesky people beneath them would do what they were told, then they would be able to place the probe exactly where it should be. And right. And I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the world of, well, the work of Ralph Stacey. He's a complexity thinker and he, um, not, yeah, no, but he, he makes a similar point that, you know, one of the, pro- one of the problems with the sort of management class and the birth of the MBA was they wanted to, there was this desire to turn it into, into a profession, right? This professionalization of management. And one of the ways you do that is you develop, you know, mathematical models and, and these academic disciplines in order to give it some sense of respectability. And that was actually a problem. Yeah. So it's an interesting question that, because I actually chimes with something I was just writing as to how management should be a profession, but it, it's not a profession like that. It should be a profession yeah. that has a, a body of techniques and knowledge and so on of its own, but it's certainly not the knowledge of having the, uh, the, the, the kind of uniquely superior knowledge um, embedded, embedded in, the, in the CEO. I mentioned Dick Rumelt a bit earlier. There's a lot, Rumelt is a very nice story of going to talk to Steve Jobs just after Jobs had gone back to Apple in 1997 and asking Jobs, so what are you going to do? What's your strategy going to be now you're in charge of Apple again? And Jobs' response was, I'm going to wait for the next big thing. And actually that, makes sense of what Jobs then did, because the next big thing actually turned out to be downloading digital music. And that led to the iPod. And the iPod was essentially the precursor of the smartphone. And everything that happened in relation to Apple relates to that. But it was not, he didn't know. And actually, nobody has ever known how this computing, personal electronics market was going to evolve. Uh, People have tried a whole variety of things, and Apple got a few things right, but Apple also got many things wrong. And the same is true of Microsoft. And of course, it's true in spades on IBM. And we still talk about PCs, which comes from the IBM PC. But it actually was the PC that destroyed IBM's traditional market position. Right. Yeah. And another way of looking at what Steve Jobs was saying there was that he was saying, I don't know. Right. Yes. He's being on it. I I don't know. know Yeah. Right. Uh, Well, what he did know was, was not what the future was going to be, but what he did know was what Apple's capabilities were. Yeah. And they were in essentially design and very. Uh, consumer electronics was very friendly to users and consumers. And he seized an opportunity to develop that particular concept. In fact, one vision he had, which relatively few people in that industry seem to have, was that actually the, the future was in developing devices which you didn't have to understand to be able to use. <laughs> Yeah, and I know that caused a lot of consternation, consternation yeah. amongst the engineers that he yes. sewed everything up, right? Yeah. But those um, first introduction to computers was taking stacks of punch cards to a gigantic machine in Oxford on Banbrook Road. <laughs> Absolutely relate to that kind of that kind of change. Right. Right. And the other thing you, d- you describe, and this is related, but perhaps for our listeners, you could, you could lay out this idea of abductive reasoning and, and what, what that is and why that matters. Yeah, and that goes back to more than a century ago, actually. It was an American um, pragma- <laughs> pragmatist. Um, interesting, there's a, this U.S. school of philosophy at the first part of the turn of the century, early 20th century, called Pragmatists, which is, a, to my mind, is a good label for useful philosophers. And Peirce <laughs> taught three styles of reasoning. The deductive, which is you set out a set of, logically, you set out a set of premises, and you derive conclusions from that. 
And that's what people do in mathematics and physics. Uh, there's the inductive, where you make observations about the world and you formulate hypotheses based on that, and you test them against um, uh, again by experiments of a variety of kinds. And that's what people typically do in biological sciences, medicine and the like. And finally, there's the abductive, which is you're dealing with essentially unique situations. And what you try to do is find coherent explanations for, uh, for these unique situations. And typically lawyers and historians will engage in abductive reasoning. And I think, to quote again, Keynes on what economists should do, I think that he didn't frame it in these terms, but I would frame it as saying that you need deductive, inductive, and abductive reasoning in order to deal with the kind of problems we're talking about in yeah. the financial worlds. And that's true, I think, both of economists and of business people. Yeah. And yet it's somehow that the... the, the the abductive is seen as is, is denigrated or somehow minimized that's that's not professional or not yeah. academic right yeah yeah no and that, uh, a lot of people would really like to be like physicists or claim they have the kind of knowledge which nasa had for their space probe uh so physics is in this sense a kind of queen of the sciences but it doesn't mean that it's an appropriate methodology for every other walk of life. Right. And it comes back again, they're dealing, often dealing with stationary processes. And I thought that that's a phrase I'd never heard before. I did, and not that these, these, this idea of a, of a stationary process or stationarity was a new word to me. But these are, so just explain that again, I think, for people so that they get clear in their head, you know, when, what, what that means and, and when a certain way of thinking of, about those problems applies. Yeah, so we talked earlier about the motion of the planets. We know the equation of the planets. And over 500 years, we've seen them follow these equations consistently. Um, when people first started talking about probabilities, and it's, it's an interesting observation that probabilistic reasoning came relatively late in the kind of history of, the, of human thought. We were struck when we thought about it that... Um, Probably the probability theory was first developed in the 17th century for gambling. It was a, in fact, there's a story which seems to have some validity. The first maths of probability was developed when a, the French Chevalier de Meur asked uh, a couple of rather distinguished French mathematicians if they could give him some advice on how to gamble more effectively. <laughs> um, and uh, as I say, what's striking is that the Greeks and Romans gambled. They had some pretty good mathematicians around, but no one ever seems to have posed that question to Plato or Aristotle or to... Um, anyway, or Euclid. Anyway, people then started seeing that you could use this kind of maths in other ways. Uh, one of the first applications was to draw up life expectancy tables. And people could use that to set life insurance premium. And there were various other applications of that kind to what were essentially stationary processes. Another strange story we found was that uh, the Guinness family in the late 19th century decided they needed some smarter people than them to run the brewery. So they started recruiting Cambridge graduates, and one of them was a a mathematician called William Gossett. And he published a series of papers uh, setting out some of the foundations of modern statistics. And they wouldn't allow them to publish his paper. The Guinness family wouldn't allow them to publish the papers under his own name. So there's a series of papers written by student, whom we now know is this man, William Gossett. But what he was doing was he was controlling eff effective quality control of the Guinness brewing process. And that was a state, essentially a stationary process. You um, uh, put in the same stuff into the bats or whatever you brew beer in every day, and you got slightly different 
results as a result of random factors in the uh, in the ingredients and so on. So he developed a quality control mechanism uh, based on theory of statistics. And of course, that's the precursor to Six Sigma and all these other kind of um, uh, modern statistical management techniques. I mentioned earlier how a lot of this development came during the Second World War, when, once again, you, you applied some very smart people to solve a range of military logistics problems and the like. That led to big advances there. These are kind of stationary processes where you're repeating the same thing over and over again. But it's never quite the same thing over and over again. So you can describe the results in statistical probability probability yeah. terms, and you can manage the process using mechanisms of statistical control. Right. Uh, but the mistake has been to believe that you could apply these kind of methods uh, in a whole variety of areas. So um, General Electric could uh, very usefully apply these kind of processes when it was making aero engines, but they weren't relevant to its financial services businesses, as eventually they learned considerable cost. Yeah. And, and these, so what are the things that characterize, you know, for people, you know, thinking about this, what, what are the things that characterize non-stationary processes? I know you've touched on these again, but I think it bears repetition in, in terms of us getting really hammering this point. Yeah, it's essentially that the underlying determinants remain unchanged. So that um, I talked about mortality tables as one of the first applications of that. And that's a good example to take because... They do remain unchanged, but they don't remain completely unchanged. So there have been long-term trends, quite marked improvements over longish periods in mortality rates. But you can model these shifts. What you can't model in these kind of ways, of course, are the the pandemics that involve completely different sets of equations for a period of time. So that applying these kind of mortality tables would not have helped you in the in the last year. You can develop, of course, different kind of models for these for these pandemics. But I think we're all, all aware, or I hope we're now all aware, uh, of the strengths and limitations of these kind of models in this kind of context. People mistakenly use these models for predictions. They were useful. Uh, in the way I was describing earlier, for identifying the key parameters. The predictions based on them have turned out to be very poor. The identification of the things that matter and the identification of the kind of information you needed to make decisions has been rather good. But I think people are not yet ready properly to understand the use of models in, in these kind of ways. But politicians and the public want the scientists to tell them what's going to happen and they can't have that kind of certainty right yeah so so it's the it's, it's a two-way thing isn't it it's it's the the scientists let go of physics envy <laughs> and uh, it's the public's let go of 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 demanding that the, the scientists come up with the answers and you know you can see the corollary in management right it's it's a sort of the, the management being able to say i don't know and the people giving up looking to their leaders to provide all the answers, something like that. Yeah, I, I remember a classic session on that where I, uh, it was run by a very senior businessman and the two other speakers at it were myself, and the guy who was then chief economic advisor to the Treasury. And the businessman started off by with a long tirade about how useless economists were. And... We, the two of us, then both explained uh, that economists couldn't do prediction and that economic developments were not of a kind that was susceptible to kinds of predictions. Uh, but there were a great many things that could be done to help understand either the business or the evolution of the economy. And at the end of it, the businessman was tearing out his hair in frustration and saying, but I want people to tell me what is going to happen. 
Right, that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah, a perfect illustration of the frustrations at play. Yeah, no, no, I, I can see that. Um, now, the other thing that you mentioned, which so I think that to me is like one of the aspects of of, of human nature that we're dealing here. This sort of this 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 desire for certainty, um, but you also talk about the, the, the this need or this appetite for doomsday scenarios. Um, and how that can can play in in terms of um, the, the other the other side of this. I wonder if you could you know just talk to that a little bit. Um, oh, there are there are narrative. I talk, I've talked. We've talked a bit about the way in which humans uh, relate to narratives rather than to models, and there are a whole variety of models uh, of narratives that actually keep recurring through human history. They're, you know, some of the psychologists and people doing literary studies have emphasized how there's a fairly sm- a small number of, of plots, as it were. So why, why is it that people are concerned about, are so concerned about climate change? Well, some of it is to do with actually the models, but a lot of it is to do with, uh, it fits into two or three very pervasive and recurrent narratives. There's the apocalyptic narrative, we're all doomed. And um, there's the um, flagellation narrative, uh, we're all going to suffer because of our overindulgence in the past. There's the invisible poison. If we're suffering unpleasantness, it's because something we can't see has been put into the, into the atmosphere or the wells or something like that. And this this particular story resonates with with all of these. So there are models we we like to find, and the apocalyptic narrative. Well, the apocalyptic narrative has been going for thousands of years, and will no doubt run for thousands of years uh, to come. And there will always be people on on mountain tops wishing for the last day to arrive. <laughs> Yeah, and there will always be modelers who are prepared to put the right numbers into a spreadsheet yes. to 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 back up that narrative. Yes. So, so these are the economists who have predicted twenty out of the last five recession. <laughs> oh, I and mean, was it the the IMF that you you call out for not having pr- predicted a single? <laughs> they predicted <Yes>. nothing. <laughs> I mean, isn't that extraordinary? Yeah. And I, and, I, and I couldn't help thinking, I mean, my degree is in engineering. You know, if, if, if engineers had as poor a track record as economists, you know, we would, we'd have no bridges, the aeroplanes would be falling out of the skies. I mean, it would be disastrous. Yeah. But, of course, that goes back to um, what we were saying earlier, that uh, most economists know we're not very good at making these kind of predictions. Um, but uh, the demand for them exists regardless. Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's interesting. So, so, so you believe that most economies, economists know that? Yeah, but also you can, uh, you can say qualitative things without, uh, uh, without being able to quantify them. So to my mind, it was not very difficult uh, to, to see that what was happening between 2003 and 2007 was going to end in tears. But when it was going to end in tears and how was another matter altogether. And it can be rather minor proximate events that actually bring about that, uh, the, the, these kind of stories. So, uh, I mean, we have in a sense, large bubbles at the moment in terms, the biggest one is the kind of whole crypto, non-fungible token, SPAC kind of story. Uh, and this is a story with a, well, in my view, we know how this story ends. We just do not know how it ends and how quickly it ends. Right. That's interesting. And anything in the, in the realm of fiat currency or... In- yeah. And of course, what 
what gives speculative bubbles in finance their particular character is the people who believe in these models uh, believe they've been proved right and the skeptics proved wrong. So you may think that cryptocurrency is a scam, but I've made five million pounds on my bitcoins in the last whatever period it is. Right, right. Um, yeah, so, so, so I can see that's uh, yeah, the other side of this. The other thing I wanted to talk about, which, um, which I loved, was your critique of behavioral economics. So I'd become quite seduced by a lot of that. So those not people yeah. familiar with it. This, this is this idea that we're all, we're all biased and um, these biases affect uh, our, ration, our ability to be rational and are kind of, if you like, flaws in the way that we as humans think. And, and you've got a very strong critique of that, which, which I enjoyed. Yeah, I went to a conference on behavioral economics and the people in the audience were sitting, sitting around tables and there were about 50 tables, each of which had a, a, a placard on it with a bias. So there was availability, heuristic, confirmation bias, and so on. And raised the question, if we have all these, all these biases, how is it that we've managed to get here? How did we do so well? Um, and the thing is that um, behavioral economics started in the 1950s as a critique of economic models of rationality. And it somehow metamorphosed into a critique of people for not conforming to the economist models of, um, of rationality. But actually, the, our counter to that is to say that many of these so-called biases are, um, are actually adaptive responses to a very complicated world. And what happens is, if you, if you sit people in the basement of a laboratory at Princeton, and pose them rather silly questions, uh, they give the wrong answer. So um, an example we take in the book is there's uh, the availability heuristic, classic example of that is uh, how many words in English have K as the first letter or the third letter, more as the first, more as the third. Now, it turned, so, and, and the observation, was that more people come up, most people say first letter, because it's easy to think of words that have K as the first letter, like my surname. <laughs> and harder to think of words like acknowledge that have it as the yeah. third letter. Uh, but then there are two observations about, about that. One is we, uh, we actually uh, managed, because computers have advanced since they did that experiment, to interrogate a much larger dictionary. And it turns out that there are, in fact, more words in the English language that have K as the first letter. Or in our big dictionary, there are. But the sensible answer to this question is not to give an answer, but to say, why do you want to know this? And if you can give me a reasonable answer to that, I'll do some work in order to find out. And, uh, you know, similarly, we, we give various other examples, the so-called Linda problem, where you're asked, is it more, you're given a rather brief description of Linda, and you're asked, is it more likely that she's a, uh, uh, you, you give an impression Linda's a rather left-wing, strident character. And then you're asked, is it more likely that she's a, a bank manager, that she's a bank manager who is an active feminist? or she's a spokesperson for the Animal Liberation Front. And certainly my experience asking that question is people give one third, one third, one third answers to these questions. And the standard response is to say that uh, hardly anybody is a spokesperson for the Animal Liberation Front, whereas a lot of people are bank managers. So it must be more likely she's a bank manager than a, a spokesperson. And it can't be more likely that she's a bank manager and a feminist than that she's a, a bank manager. So the only good answer is bank manager. But why don't people give that answer? Well, we know perfectly well why they don't give that answer. They give that, don't give that answer because they think in terms of stories. Yeah. And the story that says, 
I'm giving you this information about Linda, and, the, and by the way, she's a bank manager, doesn't fit together, whereas the other two stories do. Yeah. And yeah. People, people are thinking about this in an entirely sensible way. It's just a different way from the way in which it's framed uh, by the experiment. Right. Extreme case, to take another example, is they show people something that says, a bird in the, the hand, and ask people to read it. And most people read a bird in the hand. Well, who is actually making the mistake? <laughs> the person who asks the stupid question, <laughs> or the person who's answering it. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but I also like that, you know, just going back to the Linda question again, you know, the, the answer to this in strict probabilistic terms is, is incorrect if you say she's a feminist bank manager, right? But, but again, it's a sort of misapplication of this idea of, 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 of probabilistic reasoning being important. Yes, that's Seems. right, exactly. Um, um, you, you're attempting to frame questions in probabilistic terms that are not sensibly done that way. And there are two responses. One is to say this is not the right way of framing this kind of question. And the second, which I've given several times to this, is if you tell me why, why, why you want to know this, I will find out. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and, uh, that's the sensible answer a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think that, that, that carries over into the real world when we're asked to, if those are in a position where we're, who are being asked to model out scenarios, um, you know, why, yeah, why do we need this information? Or I don't know, or the, the sort of simple, straightforward responses. Um, it's, it's a, I suppose it, as part of me, it feels like the ev evolution, again, I come back to sort of the management context of a sort of management culture is to get more comfortable with, I don't know. Why do we think that information is important? And then this other question, like, but, but what's really going on here? And then, Coming, you know, to your the term we've used here, abductive reason. What are the, you know, emergent narratives? Now that's a term from the kind of complexity sciences. What are the emerging narratives here? What could be the co coherent narratives we could create given our current situation that might help us to move forward? I mean, that's a sort of slightly, totally different way of thinking about how sort of how we take action and move forward in the world. Then we need to build models. Yeah. And can I create a coherent narrative? that is robust and resilient to things I'm not going to be able to anticipate. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So, um, you know, a coherent narrative that's sort of robust and resilient to things I'm not able to <laughs> anticipate. How does one do that when, by definition, one doesn't know what's coming? Well, when I say things one can't anticipate, um, I mean anticipate in specific terms. Right. Um, you know, Taleb has this widely used phrase, the black swan. And black, black swans, um, that term is used in one of two ways. One is um, long tail events. Uh, you know, if, if you toss a coin a hundred times, you will sometimes get a um, hundred heads in a row. Although that's an interesting case to take, because if you do get a hundred heads in a row, uh, you should look for other explanations than you, you've experienced a 25 standard DV. Uh, but the true black swan uh, was the event which you can't anticipate uh, because you can't conceive of it, that you can't have a probability of inventing the wheel. Because if you could imagine the probability of inventing the wheel, you've already invented the wheel. Right. Um, um, now, we can't anticipate these things, but there are a lot of things um, uh, about which we have knowledge, but not detailed and specific knowledge. And there's no better example of that than the pandemic story. We're slightly proud of the fact that we say in the book, uh, the world, it is likely that the world will be hit by a pandemic caused by some virus which does not yet exist which we wrote in 2019. Uh, and this was not because we were immensely prescient. You know, that was a true statement. 
but it was not a statement which enabled one to attach a probability to a pandemic, break virus-induced pandemic, breaking out in any particular time uh, and any particular place. So we needed to have asked ourselves the question, do we have strategies that are robust and resilient to this? To which in most cases, the answer seemed to be no. Right. Um, and, but that's, again, a different way of conceiving about how we, how we, I suppose, think about the future and conceive the future. It's not in terms of forecasts and, and probability ranges of, of certain events. It's what, what could happen. Is, is, that, is that the question we're asking? Like, what, what could happen? Yeah. Let, let's think about the kind of things that could happen. And, uh, you know, we can have conversations from time to time about the kind of things that could happen and what, what, how would we be affected? How would, be, how would we respond if they did? But, of course, that's quite costly. Yeah. So we could and should have had supply chains that were more resilient to a pandemic than we did. But we'd have, to, we'd have had to invest money up front in order to be able to do that. And it's difficult to get authorization for that without being able to say, look, I think this thing is going to break out in Wuhan in three months' time. So, so that's interesting then. So, how, so what is the value in asking those questions if we then can't you know, make any changes to how we operate based on the answer to those questions? Well, we have to learn that we should make changes to how we operate based on them. So we've had this emphasis on um, lean processes, which are in a sense the opposite of resilient. Um, in the financial sector particularly, we talk about protecting yourself with um, uh, redundancy and modularity. And the financial sector is the extreme case where both redundancy and modularity have been regarded as indicators of inefficiency, really. Yeah. So that, uh, but uh, to great expense in the end, but uh, redundancy was banks saying, if we've more capital than the regulatory minimum, we have too much. And events proved that banks really can't have too much capital. And uh, modularity means creating systems that are not so interdependent that part of the system collapsing leads to the, the breakdown of the system as a whole. And we didn't have that kind of modularity and that very nearly brought about the collapse of the system as a whole. Yeah. And I think you could make a similar argument outside the, well, for a lot of, for a lot of connected companies right now, they, they don't face perhaps the same same systemic risks as financial institutions, but they still, they, they, they still experience you know, very high risk. I mean, I'm somebody who used to work for Arthur Anderson, who was caught up in the Enron controversy. It was an accounting firm, right, that uh, basically went under on the, on the back of one, one bad audit. Yeah, and basically what was happening in Houston, where yeah. you, you would never go. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, so, yeah, I, but I suppose you don't, you, you don't find the motivation to build in redundancy and modularity unless you're asking those, those questions, what could right. happen? Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Good. Well, it feels like we've, um, we've had a really good <laughs> tour of, 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 the, of the central ideas in this book. Is there anything we've sort of missed or anything that, that you felt was salient that we haven't touched? All right. All right. I, I think there's one concluding um, remark which follows really from this emphasis on robustness and resilience, which is saying these things are about managing risk. Um, but if you have managed risk, then uncertainty is not something to be frightened of, but actually something to be welcomed because it's uncertainty that makes one's personal life interesting and it's uncertainty in the business environment that gives people opportunities to gain competitive advantages, make profits, innovate effectively. So we should manage risk and embrace uncertainty. Touche. Well, thank you uh, once again, John. This was uh, a yeah, wonderful conversation. And um, 
I mean, it's a it's a long book, but it's it's really it's worth it. Um, I've got to say, uh, for anybody who's listening uh, and is interesting in uh, in reading the book, um, you know, it's it's accessible language. There's some some great stories. Yeah, so uh, thoroughly recommended. And um, thank you for writing it with Mervyn King, of course. You know, your co-author. Good. And uh, thank you, Jed. Yes, we'll put we'll put links to the book. Is there any, any anybody else any anywhere else you might point people if they if they're interested in any of these themes other than the book? Well, we can find a range of things about it and some of the other things I've done on my website. Okay, that's the other thing we might point people to. Okay, we'll we'll put a link to that as well. Wonderful. Thanks once again. <laughs> this has been great. Thank you.